Additional Ethernet Switch Features. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the additional features that your Ethernet switches can provide for you. So your Ethernet switchers have a variety of different features that can help you enhance your network performance, your redundancy, your security, your management, your flexibility, and your scalability. Some of the common things that we're going to talk about are things like VLANs, virtual LANs, trunking, spanning tree protocol or STP, link aggregation, power over Ethernet, port monitoring, and user authentication. Uh, we'll actually break out VLANs, trunking, and STP in separate modules because there's more to talk about in those. So we're going to skip those and come back to them later. So link aggregation. What link aggregation does is it tries to alleviate the congestion in your networks. So if you look at the image on the top left, you can see we have three clients, each transmitting at 100 megabits per second. But we have the switches communicating to each other at 100 megabits per second. So essentially we have 300 megabits per second coming into the switch, but only 100 coming out of the switch. If you think of like a funnel and you're pouring a jug of water into it, you're going to end up backing up that funnel, and that's what happens here. So to overcome this, what we have to do is we have to create a, either a faster link between our switches, and if that's not possible because you're using older Cat5 cabling, where you're limited to 100 megabits per second, we can instead do link aggregation, where we can bundle together several 100 megabit per second connections into a single connection. So in the bottom here, you can see I have uh, four ports, ports one through four, on each switch being bundled together, that's what that red circle symbolizes, in a link aggregation. That allows the communications from switch one to switch two to operate four times the speed of a single gigabit connection, giving us four gigabytes of bandwidth. That then frees up the other ports to be able to uh, operate at one gigabit per second each. This combination of the physical uh, connections will appear to be a single logical connection when we're dealing with our switches, and it gives us more bandwidth available to inc uh, increase the bandwidth and minimize our congestion. And the reason why you don't need to have a one-for-one -one ratio, for instance, I wouldn't just have this for four one gigabit connections, having four, um, four computers being served at a gigabit each over a four gigabit connection, is most computers aren't transmitting and receiving 100% of the time. So if I have a 24-port switch, and I'm using four ports for link aggregation and 20 of them to serve my clients, that should be adequate for most uses. If you see that it's not, you can then add more into that link aggregation bundle and maybe raise it up to five or six if you need to, to increase the bandwidth even further. Another feature we have is what's called Power Over Ethernet. And this is the 802.3AF standard. Um, you want to make sure you remember again, any of those 802.something standards, you should write them down and remember what they are. Supplies, uh, this supplies our electrical power over our Ethernet connections. So you have to have Cat5 or above cabling to be able to support this, which most networks at this point have. Um, and what it does is it's going to provide you 15.4 watts of power to a device. There's two different types of devices that we talk about here. We talk about a PSE, which is our power sourcing equipment, and PDs, or power devices. In my diagram here, the switch is the PSE, the power sourcing equipment. It's providing the 15 watts of power to the IP phone, which is the powered device. The real benefit of powered over Ethernet, you can find that in uses such as VoIP and security cameras. And the reason why is instead of having to have a data cable coming to it and a power outlet being run to that phone or that security camera, you can just run it all over a single Category 5 or above cable and provide the power through the switch. Um, this is good for low power devices. Again, security cameras are useful for this as well as VoIP phones. Port monitoring and port mirroring. So one of the things we talked about with switches was that they added security to the point where only traffic went to the device that it was, that it was identified based on its MAC address. So if I have port 1 talking to port 3, all the other ports aren't going to see it. Only those two ports are going to see it. Well, with port monitoring or port mirroring, what we can do is we can actually monitor those ports or mirror those ports out to another port for us to be able to see it. So this is used for logging and troubleshooting purposes, and it's helpful to analyze our packets as they're flowing across the network. We can use something like a network analyzer, like Wireshark, and hook it up to a port and have all of the ports mirroring uh, over to that last port. So essentially, that's what we're doing here in this, in this uh, diagram. I might have a 24-port uh, port switch, and ports 1 through 23 can be mirrored out to port 24, where I hook up my Wireshark terminal. And that way, everything you guys are sending on ports 1 through 23 can be seen by the security device. Um, this is very useful when we're using network sniffers uh, and network analyzers, such as Wireshark. And port mirroring, what it's going to do is it's going to actually make a copy of all the packets for us. And so as you can see in this diagram, as the traffic is going between the PC and the server, 
an additional copy of it is being sent over out that mirrored port down to the laptop with Wireshark so that we can analyze it and look at that traffic. So yeah, uh, the question is, you know, is that what we do with network security centers? And yes, the network security centers will usually have a port, a port mirrored off of the switch so that they can see that traffic and be able to run analysis on it. Um, the other way to accomplish it that some people will do is they will go old school and they'll take a, an old four port hub and they'll hook that right off their router. So it'll go from the router to the hub and then the hub, one will go to the analysis machine and the other one will go down to a switch. But again, when you do that, you're splitting the bandwidth in half. So it's better to do it through port monitoring like this because you don't have that speed loss. The next one we're going to talk about is 802.1x. And again, anytime you see an 802. something, you better write it down. Uh, what this one is is user authentication. So it allows your switches to have additional security. So for security purposes, your switches can require the users to authenticate themselves before they get access to the network. Um, once they're authenticated, there's a key that is generated and provided between the two devices. The device wanting accent, access is called the supplicant, and the device who's going to give access is called the authenticator. So in this case, your client is going to be the supplicant and your switch is going to be the authenticator. The authentication server is used to check the supplement, supplicant's credentials and create the key. And this key is used then to encrypt traffic coming to and from that device. This allows us to have a wired network with encryption between the device and the switch to ensure communications aren't uh, snooped in on by other people. It just gives you additional layers of security. Uh, management access and authentication. So there's a lot of different ways that you can manage your switches, um, and most switches are managed switches at this point uh, because it gives you a lot more flexibility and security in your devices. You can do this using SSH or a console port. Uh, when you use SSH, that is going to operate over port 22, and it is a remote administration program that securely allows you to connect to the switch and operate it in a text-based manner. So that you, it's almost like a command line environment. Once you SSH into the switch, you'll then be using that switch's operating system to communicate with it. So if it's Cisco, you're going to be using iOS, for instance. Uh, with the console port, you're actually going to do it locally. I'm going to hook up that blue cable, which is called a rollover cable, to my laptop. The RJ45 end of it goes into the console port of the switch, and I will be able to connect directly to that, that switch and do all the same commands that I would do from SSH remotely, but do it locally. Um, the third way that we can do this is what is called out-of-band management, OOB. And with out-of-band management, the idea here is to keep all of our network configuration devices on a separate network. We usually call this the management VLAN. And we'll put all of our managers and our administrator laptops on that network. And that prevents other users from getting in and messing with our switches configurations and keeping only the, the administrators on that network. So that's out-of-band management, which is a very good security practice. But again, the two ways to connect directly to your switch, one is remotely through SSH, and the second one is through the console port locally. Uh, by physically being cabled to it. The next thing we're going to talk about is first hop redundancy. And so this is what the first thing we're going to talk about that gives us some additional redundancy in our networks. So our devices are configured with the default gateway, and if that default gateway goes down, what ends up happening is our switch, our, our computers cannot get out to the, the network. So if our first hop is the first router that we're looking at, um, and that router goes down, we would end up being down on our network. And we don't want that. So what we do is we actually can put two routers together and have an active router and a standby router, as you can see in the picture. Now, when I configure my workstation, it can only be configured with one default gateway. So I can't configure it to use both those routers. So instead, what we do is we create a router group and have a virtual router that we identify, as you can see here in the middle. So when I configure this workstation, I'm going to configure his gateway to be this virtual router that really doesn't exist, that is this dot three. And what it's going to end up happening is anytime the computer tries to go to dot three, it's then going to go to whichever of these two in the group is the active router, which right now is the one on the left, which is dot one. If dot one went down, then the standby router picks up and will answer up. And so it's basically whoever's going to answer the phone, if you want to think of it that way, we're just going to call this number and whichever one answers is going to give service to this client. So that gives us redundancy. Uh, the first um, hot standby routing protocol that we had, the HSRP, was a Cisco developed one. Uh, called HSRP, and it uses this virtual IP and the MAC addresses to provide an active and a standby router. The active router answers the request, and if it goes offline, the standby router then picks up the load for it. There's some other first hop redundancy protocols out there as well. Uh, one is called Gateway Load Balancing Protocol, GLBP, 
and that is another Cisco proprietary one, meaning it's only on Cisco devices. Uh, two other ones that are open source and can be used elsewhere is the VRRP, which is Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol, or the CARP, which is the Common Address Redundancy Protocol. Generally, when people are talking about first hop redundancy, though, the one you're going to hear them reference is HSRP because it, it really took a lot of the market share because Cisco was the network leader for so long. Uh, and when you see your exam, that is probably the one that's going to get mentioned most. The next thing that we can do is we can do MAC filtering, traffic filtering, and quality of service with our switches. So what MAC filtering does is it's going to permit or deny traffic based on a device's MAC address to improve security. So the way this works is the switch is configured so that only people on the allowed list can get access to the network. Or conversely, we can make a denied list and say everyone's allowed except for the people who match this, these MAC addresses. So if John has been doing bad stuff on the network, we can actually deny his computer based on its MAC address, and every time he tries to plug in, no matter which drop he's going to, he's going to get denied. Conversely, if you're, in, if you're very security-minded, you might do it the opposite way and say everyone's denied except for these allowed people. And, but then you have to go through your entire network and start putting in every MAC address on every switch. Okay? So, um, so that becomes kind of a pain in the butt. And that's MAC filtering. Um, another way I've seen this done is what we call sticky ports. You can configure your switch where the first person who attaches to it, that MAC address gets stuck to that port. That's why we call it sticky ports based on MAC filtering. So it's kind of dynamically assigned MAC filtering. So you open the port, first person who plugs into it, its MAC address gets assigned. Nobody else is allowed to use that port except for that machine. And then if you need to upgrade that machine or change out that network card, you've got to reopen that port again, take off the sticky MAC, put on a new one, and then plug in the new machine. Um, it's another variation of MAC filtering. Another thing we can do is what's called traffic filtering. And traffic filtering is done with multi-layer switches where you can permit or deny traffic based on IP addresses or port applications, much like a firewall would do. It's a very basic form of a firewall. Um, and this is done using what's called an access control list, where you will allow or deny traffic based on the IP or the port. The third thing we can do is we can do quality of service. And what ends up happening is your switch will make its forwarding decisions based on a traffic's priority. So I can configure it where if you're doing streaming media, for instance, like watching YouTube, that's a lower priority than web traffic. Or if you're doing a voice phone call, a VoIP call, that's the highest priority because you don't want to have stuttering in the phone calls, right, or jittering in the phone calls. Quality of service is a really big topic. We're going to have an entire module dedicated just to quality of service. For now, you just need to understand that for quality of service, you have the ability of saying this traffic is more or less important than that traffic, and it will prioritize it based on that. And that is our additional Ethernet switch features.